Welcome. I think we're going to get started. Thank you all for coming to the main day of replay, um, the first the first year of this conference. I'm going to be your host for the day. My name is Charles Zedleski. I'm the chief product officer at Temporal. I've been in the company for a little over a year, and I'm extremely excited to welcome you all uh, here today. Um, Replay is a uh, conference hosted by Temporal, but it's a conference that we want to be for uh, the larger developer community. And we see this as a, something we want to do every year. Um, and of course, it's going to be a lot about Temporal, but it, we want it to be about all kinds of interesting things that are developing in software development, and particularly in, in back-end or server-side software development. Um, and we think that there's an enormous potential for, 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 uh, for the future years. Um, and when I thought about the fact that this was the first ever conference, uh, and I thought about the, um, the adoption of Temporal, uh, I kept thinking about beginnings, um, uh, because I've had the fortune to see movements, technological movements, start very small and get surprisingly big in a short amount of time. And uh, that's obviously why I found myself at Temporal. And I like to think it's why you found yourselves here. Um, and uh, the, uh, so I think what's, what, for all of us at Temporal, what gets us so excited about um, this event and getting to be with all of you is you know, w when, you, when you work with people at Temporal, there's a sense of just how big this all could get someday and how important it could be for uh, technology and for software development generally, but how small it still is right now. Um, but you could kind of see where it's all going to go. And so there's this sense of kind of pent-up energy of some, some kind of chain reaction that we know is, is getting unleashed. Um, and uh, this, this, sort of a, uh, this sort of event is part of that. Um, and what I think what a technical movement becomes uh, is a lot is 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 as much a function of the users and the community as it is about the technology. And uh, one of the things which makes replays so special for us is we could not be more proud of the community that we get to be a part of. Um, we uh, at Temporal we thoroughly enjoy the interactions that we have with the user community on Slack or on Discourse or at meetups. Um, and the fact that we get to do it all together here in person today is just phenomenal. And if you look at the speakers we have today, and I'll be thanking our speakers multiple times, but uh, please know that at Temporal, like for, for speakers, for the users, we are flattered by the quality of the company that we keep. And we know that it is a, a, a big reason why the interest in Temporal continues to grow is because of all of you. So thank you very much for helping make this real. Um, just to illustrate the point, you know, this is kind of the current uh, adoption of Temporal. These are pingbacks of usage of Temporal in any given day um, since the inception of the project. Um, and the interest has been growing uh, exponentially. Um, but uh, that, uh, and, and is now, we, some, I, I can't get into the precise numbers, let's say it's the many tens of thousands and perhaps even hundreds of thousands of developers that are using Temporal on a weekly basis. Um, but the thing is, is that for most of you who are here, that's not news to you. You were way back over there, right? And what I, what I would, you, know, you, were, you were sort of ahead of the curve. And what I would submit, and I think everyone who attends this conference and has the first t-shirt, which we won't make any more of, will eventually look back in this too and say, oh yeah, I was there. I was, this, that spot on the curve all the way in the right is going to look extremely small in scale in another two years' time. Um, so thank you for, for kind of helping set all this in motion. Where uh, we we couldn't be more excited that we get to realize um, that we get to realize this vision. Um, okay, enough about about beginnings. Um, I wanted to also just mention a few logistical bits. We have an exciting lineup of speakers. We also have a bunch of breaks that are going to that are uh, uh, going to be in between. Um, the majority of the talks we have today, uh, there's going to be opportunity for Q and A, which is all going to be done through Slido. So could we pull up just like a representative example of a Slido QR code for a second? Possibly. There we go. So we'll have QR codes like these for uh, all but one of the sessions. Uh, and I'll, take, I'll be uh, reading off all the questions and I'll ask the speakers. So that's the general order of the day.
Thank you again for your attendance. And with this, I would now like to introduce the co-founder uh, of the Temporal Open Source Project, the co-founder of the Cadence Open Source Project, the co-founder of Temporal, uh, our fearless leader, uh, Maxim Fatiev. It's uh, certainly pretty emotional to be here. Uh, it's first time, first time ever I, I, I give a keynote, so bear with me. And it's certainly it's first time we, we make a conference and a super big deal for us. Certainly, when we started to plan that, we didn't expect such a attendance to tell the truth. It's, uh, you know, like first time it's, you never. Know, usually they say if you have more people than your company people on the conference, you already won. But we have many more people, I think, right now, so it's really cool. And I remember five years ago, I did my first presentation about Cadence at some conference. I don't even remember the name of conference. Uh, I remember one thing that I prepared for a long time. I come there, and I get 10 people in the room. And it's not even recorded. Uh, the mistake I made is that this conference had parallel tracks, and I put word workflow in the title. And parallel track had machine learning in the title. And obviously, <laughs> hundreds, whatever people went there, and I've got 10 people in my room. It's not wasn't that bad, because technically, one of the, these 10 people was an employee, an architect, and one um, pretty well-known SAP 500. And he's still here with us, uh, so with his crew. So it means that you never know how it plays out in long, t long term. Um, but I think I, I want to just thank you, all of you to be here. And because, I, I, as Charles said, you're all early adopters. We are just starting. And uh, just I think we, we're just super grateful to all of you. So I want to talk about uh, temporal. Like we always get this question, what is it? And uh, it's very hard to describe. It's, uh, it's the hardest problem I think we have. It's not that people like our technology, but explaining what it is to other people is always the challenge. And um, I struggle with that, and all of us struggle with that. If somebody comes up the best way to describe it, even after this talk, come to me, please. I want to hear it. Uh, but first, I want to talk about vegetables. Um, really, I want to talk about uh, application architecture, but uh, vegetables are cool. So, uh, But technically, think about it. You write an application, and it doesn't matter what technology you use, what language you use, whatever you do. But um, these days, especially if system is distributed, or it needs to kind of be useful. Uh, in most systems, you want to have uh, some sort of have. You have some of the business logic, but then you need to make this business logic full torrent, torrent and reliable. And uh, usually, this reliability component is much larger than actual business logic. And then obviously you have persistence because you need to kind of do, make it durable and you want to make sure that if you have failure in recovery, you recover from persistence in disk so it can survive machine failures and so on. Um, the funny part is that uh, in real life you do this. You, you don't have them separate. You take all of that and just blend it all together. And this is the, uh, my claim is practically application architecture of majority applications these days. I would call it a smoothie application architecture. And this is exactly what we are trying to avoid. But this is our life, because uh, it doesn't matter if you use the functions, you use Kubernetes or run on bare metal, this technology helps you to run those processes, but they don't actually allow, help your application business logic to deal with failures in, in most cases, unless just restarting processes. And I think the main goal of us here is kind of get rid of smoothie ap application architecture. And imagine situation. If somebody comes and says, I don't like strawberry anymore, please, uh, uh, your customer just comes, I, I like banana. And then you have this blender going, and it's probably still going, and like, please replace ban uh, one with another. And this is what we are doing in these uh, applications, because uh, it's all sp just mixed up, and you have all your business logic and 50 functions, and it's all ma ma state machines and so on. And you don't want to have that. So what's the solution? OK, solution is cake architecture. Because you have clear layers. You can separate things out. And if you need to replace something with 
like strawberries, banana, you just do it. And you do it in one place. Um, okay, it's all cool in theory, right? How do you get there? So how do we get from the smoothie architecture to cake architecture? And my answer is, uh, it's actually durable execution. Uh, you know, like we call it workflow in temporal for historical reasons, but I, I think I, I have physics degree. And in physics, they kind of teach you to think from first principles. And I started to think about temporal in general. What is the most core abstraction we have? And my claim is the core abstraction is exactly what we can call durable execution. And let's talk about durable execution. On the surface, it's very simple. It's just a runtime environment which allows code, and usually code in a general purpose programming language, uh, to, execute, to guarantee, guarantee that it's complete, practically runs to the end. Actually, complete is probably not precise because you can have infinite loop in the middle. So technically, you want to say it, it guarantees it keeps running in the presence of all possible failures. So if you crash, uh, kind of, I don't know, power goes out in the middle of execution after full executed, or something else failed, a network uh, event happened, and so on, um, I can talk probably next five hours about possible failures in the distributed systems. But the point is that there is guarantee that this will eventually complete. And it's a very simple idea that you have code which will eventually complete in the presence of all possible failures, but in a way that uh, code doesn't see that, it just keeps executing. Uh, that, but as soon as you have this property, you, you can do all sorts of interesting things. You can guarantee compensations, you can guarantee execution. It is kind of, I would say, the next best thing after the tr dis distributed transaction. And you don't want to do distribute transactions, right? And this is the way people walk around the lack of transactions in the systems, if they can have this abstraction. Uh, other property of uh, durable execution is that, as by its nature, all the state of durable execution is always durable, persisted. So practically every variable in the durable execution is uh, practically saved in some persistent store. And it's done in a way that, you, as a programmer, you don't need to do anything about it. You just go write your code. You have your local variables, so fields, and uh, like sometimes global variables. And these things are just durable all the time. Which means that if you use durable execution to write your code, you don't need to actually even program against the database. You don't need to, because it, in our smoothie architecture, all you do is load state from database, update it, save back. Load state from database, update it, save it back, right? Call back, loads. So it's all together, all the time, and your code is broken in pieces. Here, you just write normal sequential code, and everything is fully preserved, and I think it's a very important property. I think the other very important property is that just by nature of uh, durable execution, uh, the state, um, the, any API call can take unpredictable amount of time. Any amount of time is necessary. So if you call ba uh, buzz and it takes 10 weeks, fine, it's okay because there is eventual guarantee that this call will return and you will continue executing. And uh, just think about it a little bit. It's not something we are used to, but it's a very cool property. And why is it, uh, I think, it's a cool property? Because it allows to do uh, really cool things uh, seamlessly. For example, you can just have an API call which is sleep, and you can say sleep for a month, sleep for 10 days. So if you need to do something, I don't know, send email 10 days later, you can just uh, say sleep 10 days and send email. And try to do it us using any other approach. Like, again, doing smooth architecture. You will invite your callbacks, you will have cron job, you will kind of need to tie all these things together, you need to preserve state somewhere. Here's just one line. Um, the other interesting part is that uh, durable execution is, has, and again, we are talking about abstraction, not even concrete implementation is a nice kind of this, uh, it lives in this world. It has the, all these guarantees, but it has to communicate with the external world. So it, uh, an external world is not perfect, and it can have failures. It's, it's normal. And uh, the, uh, the way it, practically it means that everything you do can uh, fail any time. So connection can fail, the external service can fail, it can be human task, and human can forget about it. Uh, how do you deal with failures in non-systems non, non which don't use durable executions? You, you do retries, usually, or compensations and so on. The cool part here is that if you call foo 
and you do it rice for five, 10 days or five milliseconds, you still call foo. There is no difference. You practically hide all this complexity of retry and it can be as, necessary, as complex as necessary with retry exponential and so on, uh, besides a single API call. We also can invoke functions for queuing. It's very common to, in asynchronous systems to put queues in between services and in between uh, components. And queues have nice properties. You can uh, rate uh, they do rate limiting, they do flow control, uh, they also do retries. Uh, but my point is that API to call them is still the same. So that is kind of my thing, is that durable execution allows you to hide so much complexity of error handling, and it's exactly what I, I said. It just allows to take this error handling out, and you as an engineer don't care. It's uh, handled by the underlying system. And, and I think it's a super cool property of the durable execution. So just to recap a little bit, uh, uh, this is a way practically to do this layered architecture. Durable execution allows you to separate very cleanly uh, the error handling and recovery code. So as durable execution guaranteed to execute, any failures will not uh, affect its execution itself. And if it needs to talk to external systems, and we need to deal with external system failures for retries, queuing, and all, any other asynchronous means, we can just have an API call, which takes a little bit longer, and, but eventually completes. Also, as I mentioned, uh, we also get persistence uh, for free, practically. I mean, from developer experience point of view. You just use your normal code, you have local variables, and um, these local variables are durable. So you don't need to actually write explicit database-related code. And also, because it's layered, you can replace one database with another without changing the line of code. So you can switch from something like, I don't know, in, in case of Temporal, you can switch from Cassandra to, uh, to Postgres, and you don't need to change a line of application code to do that, because these layers are very well defined, uh, and I think it's very important. And my claim is, uh, and that's why I think we're all here, is that durable execution is the best way, is the best developer experience to build uh, resilient systems. And uh, not necessarily distributed, people build desktop applications using that, uh, and in the future, I think we can do more of that. My, my dream is to have uh, durable execution in every cell phone as, as a library, but we'll get there one day. But I think the basic idea is that uh, this is the best, the best way to develop software uh, for certain types of systems. Obviously, it doesn't solve all the problems, but uh, there are clear big, big class of systems that it makes developer experience much, much cleaner. One thing I want to mention is uh, certainly we talk about Temporal, we had the Temporal conference, but uh, it's not just one uh, product which does that. The whole idea of Drupal execution started at the simple workflow service at AWS. I, uh, I don't know if you know about that, but I was tech lead for that service, uh, for the public release of that. It, there are multiple iterations inside of Amazon to get to the point where it, uh, simple workflow is. Then uh, Samar, uh, who's uh, CTO and co-founder of Temporal, um, went to Azure and he created a durable task framework, which later was adopted by Azure Durable Functions, and we have Azure Durable Function product. Uh, there is also in Infinitic project, which builds uh, uh, durable execution on top of Apache Pulsar. Uh, it's a pretty young project, and, uh, but I think it's some, uh, the idea is that this is not specific to like, one technology. It's a general abstraction which can be used in other places. And you've probably heard about Cadence and how Temporal kind of grew out of Cadence uh, later. And now we have Cadence project, which is, as you know, open source project and also a company. So one thing is, uh, st we started to think about these abstractions, and one thing became kind of clear is that this cake thing, technically, uh, I've saw it before in multiple places. And one place I saw this kind of layered architecture was actually when people talk about operating systems. Because operating system kind of has the same general goal. It is about uh, abstracting out complexities of uh, hardware, complexities of uh, some failure modes as well, and giving application developers uh, high-level abstraction to write the applications. Right? Because first computers were just programmed directly against the metal. Now we write code in high-level languages, but all this complexity of different type of operating systems, hardware, and so on is kind of hidden from us. Uh, one thing which is interesting, if you look around, we don't have distributed systems. Like people talk about operating system for distributed world, but reality is we don't have them. 
probably we have systems like Kubernetes, but they are not. Problem with them is that they allow you to manage processes, but. As soon as you, pr you write application for a single machine, then you say this application can run, this process can run on multiple machines, you completely need to change the architecture of your application. It's not that uh, there is an operating system which allows you to seamlessly distribute things. The same way why we don't have infinitely scalable SQL databases. Just because you need to, need to make certain trade-offs, you need to do sharding and so on, because just general SQL relational doesn't work like in, uh, if you want to distribute infinitely. And, uh, Thinking about durable execution, what I thought is, if you uh, take, for example, idea of operating system, an operating system operates on the level of a process. If you replace the process with durable execution, and durable execution is also a name, we, we could call it durable process if we decided to, but it's, again, it's naming. But it would allow us to write the uh, uh, operating system which hides complex, uh, like distribution part and error handling part. And I think this is a um, kind of realization which came to, oh, pressing wrong button. Uh, realization that you can have kind of operating system, but uh, application layer doesn't need to know about these failures. So practically if you write it for a single uh, machine or you run it on a huge fleet, your programming model doesn't change. And I think durable execution is a unique abstraction to do that. So far, I didn't see any either kind of attempt to do that because if you look every distributed system out there, obviously we have things, things like MapReduce, for example, which are high-level abstraction, but it's very, very specialized to very specific use case, uh, kind of big data and pipelines. But general programming model, which allows you to write application, and then you don't really uh, think about this application as running on a specific piece of hardware, I think durable execution is the first abstraction which allows you to do that. And I, I think, mm, and as you see here, the main idea is that application software doesn't need to deal, you still will have all the problems of the distributed system in the OS itself, but application is kind of hidden, uh, is uh, shielded from that. Um, certainly it is uh, a little bit stretch to kind of call temporal the operating system at this point, uh, but I think it's more like inspiration. It's think about, because I've seen people, oh, you already kind of have product, it's there, it works, it's kind of more or less complete. I just wanted this additional maybe bells and whistles, better UI and so on. But I think the uh, main, main idea is that we are just starting that uh, kind of, we need to understand what temporal is and temporal is just one of the existing things, it is much more than that. And uh, my main point is that it's day one. Like they, at Amazon they say it's day one always. Like Jeff Bezos was telling it all the time because people, oh, Amazon made so much progress, you know, it's day one. We guys, we're just starting, we will be much more. And it always was true. I, I don't know how he managed to do that, but he did it. And I think it's the same thing here, is temporally today is day one. It's a just uh, idea, it's a, it's, a, it's a useful idea. You use it in production. But I think the idea is, like, can we move it much, much more? Can we have applications built on top of that? Can we have much nicer developer experience? Can we start thinking about different ways kind of to execute these durable executions? Can we host them? Can we attach them? What about API ecosystem and so on? There are so many things we can do with this abstraction. And my main point of this kind of talk is that just think where we can move that if we uh, execute on this vision. So I want to kind of switch gears uh, from this fancy new future to today's. And uh, I just want to talk a little bit more about uh, Progress uh, Temporal as an open source project uh, as, a, as a company made uh, last year and, and maybe talk a little bit uh, future a little bit. Uh, some people who were here saw some of that, uh, but I think it's worth repeating. Um, so I think uh, for me, uh, the main goal, at least initially, of the project was to put it in the hands of more developers. And uh, what it means is that if you had, for example, a TypeScript developer, you couldn't use Temporal before, uh, before recently. And but now we've got TypeScript SDK. So if you're a TypeScript or JavaScript developer, and you're not JS developer, you practically can have the full power of Temporal uh, to, uh, and uh, I think it's uh, as, as nice as it can get to, to get uh, distributed reliable system. 
Uh, the coolest part about TypeScript SDK, I don't know if you, all of you, especially people who use other SDKs, uh, know, is that it's closest approximation to the operating system abstraction because we run every workflow in its own container practically. We use V8 isolates, but uh, the idea is that every workflow is fully isolated and determinism, which is required by Temporal, is provided out of the box by the container. Uh, which means that you cannot make no determinism mistakes inside of TypeScript code. You can do random, you can do time, you can do whatever. All these APIs are deterministic and provided by the runtime. So it's as close as you can get to the notion of the process. It's not like 100% airtight yet. There are some edge cases, but in general, it is a very, very uh, cool system because it is not done by asking developers politely do the right thing. It is provided by the runtime. Um, in the future, maybe we, we do WebAssembly, which can, uh, for certain languages, would provide similar capabilities. Other exciting uh, development is Python SDK. Um, certainly, people ask us for type of, this was one of the most requested SDKs, and uh, it's still in beta, but please, uh, it's out there, try it out, play with it, give us feedback, because the more feedback we get, faster we get it, uh, uh, it will take less time to release it. Uh, in production. But we'll, uh, we've heard that some, uh, some people already use it in production. Some, 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 some of you on bleeding edge like to be there, and uh, we appreciate that. Uh, but uh, we are working to actually have official production release very soon. And look, it's nice. Uh, I'm not a big fan of Python, but uh, no, I, you know what is kind of funny? Because uh, I have a son, he's, uh, he was 12 at the time, and he was doing this scratch programming, like visual thing and whatever. And then I showed him like two pages, like page of Python code. He's like, oh, it's a block. He just like was immediately was able to identify things just by offset. And he was able to read that code and even find a bug there. And like, okay, then after that I was converted. <laughs> <laughs> so other thing we did, um, uh, so the improvements, um, the uh, temporal light, uh, if you didn't hear about that, uh, this is the ability to run temporal server is a single process, uh, including the database, uh, uh, SQLite database. Uh, so practically you just get one binary and you have full-blown temporal service, including UI uh, in, in a single binary. It actually was uh, created by Datadog team, and we are super grateful to them to do that, to take, uh, because without them probably, we it would take very long time for us to implement. And uh, now it's, this project actually kind of graduated to the top level because uh, right now it's part of the official uh, temporal uh, organi IO organization on GitHub, but uh, I th we still collaborate very cl closely with Datadog um, team uh, on uh, improvements and uh, next uh, releases of this product. So our goal is that for development, single binary should be the, the best way to do development because it's uh, much easier than Docker Compose and all these other things. Um, uh, the other thing we've got, we've got new UI. Um, we rewrote fully UI, which we inherited from Cadence. Uh, now this UI more or less has feature parity, and, but it al will allow us to do things like uh, uh, mutations in the future. For example, you would be able to send signals, updates, and so on for UI. And just new architecture allows us to do all sorts of cool stuff and move much faster. My, my kind of dream is uh, have special UI features for them just for development. Because right now there are certain development uh, kind of workloads, you need to click too much. I want to get to the point when it's as usable as uh, ID. We'll see if we get there. But uh, now we have a uh, framework to actually uh, do that. Other, mm, one thing we, uh, we talked about applications. One thing we found is that a lot of people used, uh, one of the first use cases, they used Temporal for scheduled actions for cron as cron, practically distributed cron. And we had this cron feature in the, uh, in the product, which we built very long time ago. And the way it was built, I can tell you, we looked at that and said, okay, we don't have resources, but what would be the minim minimalistic implementation of the cron? And we put it there and it's still there. And you use it, but you hate it because it la lacks tons of features and it's hard to use and so on. So we've stopped and said, what it would take us to uh, uh, kind of think it from first principles. Can we go and uh, look at the, what would be the, uh, make uh, Temporal the best distributed cron engine out there for scheduled actions? We sp uh, spend a lot of time doing the design that and now it's there. It's actually in the open source right now, you can use it, you just need, it's behind the feature flag. But next release we'll kind of flip it, you can use it. 
So it's pretty powerful. It uh, allows us to do all sort of scheduling and um, pretty complex one and manage the scheduled jobs and so on. So please check it out. Other thing which uh, uh, we productized re uh, recently was enhanced visibility. So its ability to search workflows by custom attributes, managing those attributes and so on. Um, but it's not only about software. Uh, I think uh, from the developer's point of view, documentation is as important as software because uh, if you get uh, temporal and no documentation, yes, we have uh, Slack, we have support, but uh, it's still not uh, the best experience. I don't know if I don't know if you guys know, but uh, Temporal has five people full time working just on documentation. Uh, so we treat documentation super seriously, and it's an uh, awesome, very strong team. So uh, and we did a lot of improvements. Application development guide is one of the recent ad additions, and uh, we plan to invest more and more in that. For example, we know that uh, the documentation of the how to operate cluster, how to set up cluster, and uh, production issues is. Far from perfect, it's almost unexistent. We will heavily invest in that uh, this year and later, uh, and, uh, later uh, and the beginning of next year. Other thing is that documentation, reference documentation, is not enough. We want to people learn temporal. Some of you yesterday attended our first one-on-one -on -one class, and uh, it looks like feedback was pretty positive. Uh, we want to make sure this class is ac uh, accessible through the website, so we created learn.temporal.io website. And you would be able to, we will have more courses which you can do on your own pace. We also have in-person courses. So I think we will take a lot of, as you know, it's new technology. It's, uh, people take time to grasp, grasp it. So we will, uh, we have education team which is building those um, courses. Uh, we did some uh, service improvements. Uh, some, some of them are small, but very useful, like namespace deletion. Now you can, uh, your CI CD pipeline can create namespace, run something, and delete namespace. Simple thing, but very useful. <laughs> uh, we increased retention, and uh, we uh, did a lot of uh, refactoring of history service to make it much more stable and scalable and so on. Uh, we can give you details. But mostly it's about multi-tenancy, so we get much better multi-tenancy support now. Uh, one other thing I mentioned, enhanced visibility, but uh, the way it is done right now, it only works if you have Elasticsearch. We have kind of this weird situation when uh, you have dual mode. If you just run with uh, one database without Elasticsearch, you, you don't get all these features. So we want to have parity. So we will add uh, enhanced visibility to every SQL, SQL implement implementation, which means that if, even if your SQL Lite or MySQL or Postgres, you would be able to get all the same features as if you run with Elasticsearch. And this is uh, something which will allow us to make nice, nicer UI because you don't need to switch that. And it also will just allow you to actually do full development, for example, using SQLite because you won't have some features missing. I think it's relatively small but very important uh, addition. Uh, the other uh, feature which is uh, frequently requested is the ability to send updates to the workflow because now you can send one-way event signal. You can query workflow, but you cannot mutate state. But now you would be able to send update to the workflow, mutate state of the workflow, and update can take as long as necessary. It can take milliseconds, and it's a super optimized path with a single database, right? Or it can be as long as necessary. It can, day, it can be days. And we will support uh, all sorts of features around that. Also, obviously, workflows calling other workflows would be also supported. And um, this will practically allow you to build interactive application on top of Temporal. You could press a button and get the uh, next page as a response uh, to the, uh, it will allow practically have, I don't know, I don't know where it goes, but I'm pretty sure there are a lot of uh, people who would be very excited about that feature. Uh, versioning is another kind of pain point. Uh, uh, we know about it and uh, uh, it's super powerful because you can update workflows which are running, long running processes while they're in production. But it's uh, for situations when you just have short-lived workflows and you want to just be able to write your code, don't think about that. It's, uh, it's, not, it's far from perfect. And we are working on that. So we will have uh, native support for uh, allowing deploying new versions, running multiple set of workers through different task queues, but it will be kind of hidden from you. It will be kind of done automatically. So like all consumers will not care. They will just use start workflows on whatever task queue they are starting, but behind the scenes we will do all the right thing to route to the appropriate version. And also the other part of that is uh, self-rollouts. We want to uh, invest heavily into the ability to roll out code safely 
Because again, Temporal is not only about how you write code, it's about how you operate. We want to make sure that we are the best platform for actually operating things in production. So we'll put a lot of effort into these features. Uh, there are a lot of other features we want to, like most basic ones, like pause workflow and pause workflow, like make sure that workflow, uh, there, there are a lot of things we want to do just to make sure that you can operate things very efficiently. The other big area of investment we are going to make is what we call Nexus, and it's kind of code word, I don't know how it will end up being called at the end, but basic idea is that right now, uh, people uh, use Temporal a lot to build single application, and they build multiple applications, but uh, sharing, uh, kind of calling each other, like if you have one application, like set of workflows, and then you want to uh, expose APIs to other applications, to other set of workflows or services outside of Temporal, it's not easy. Uh, very, uh, we have child workflow in a different namespace, but it doesn't work very well, doesn't work with global uh, uh, namespaces and so on. So there are a lot of uh, limitations there. So we, we, we want to make sure that Temporal will be practically the best uh, way to expose your uh, functionality to other parts of your company or even outside of your company. And uh, this uh, can be done very cleanly for very clean defined APIs. And, uh, and also we want to make sure that this technology works not only with Temporal but uh, people outside of Temporal. So you can expose HTTP gateways, gRPC gateways to other applications. And as part of that, we also need to solve problem that industry doesn't have standard to uh, define uh, long-running operations because all oh, what we call ALO, uh, arbitrary length operation. Because uh, if you have, I don't know, standard gRPC service, HTTP service, it's, it's very easy to say, okay, this is a request I support. But then I say, if this request takes five days, how do I model that? Then you need to do web hooks, you need to do long polling, and there are different ways to do that, queues and so on. So there is no clean way to define interfaces with, for operations which can take uh, long, longer than a few milliseconds or seconds. And we want to make part that uh, if, we, if we, succeed, we succeed, we want to make it more like industry standard, which is not temporal specific, but allows to define those operations, map them to specific technologies like HTTP or uh, gRPC, and then make them uh, callable from workflows directly or workflows being able to implement those operations directly. It's a big area of, uh, there is proposal actually right, uh, right now, no, I don't know if all of you know, we have uh, temporal.io slash proposals repo, this uh, GitHub repository, and we push every time we do any kind of serious change to, the, uh, to temporal, we actually always publish proposals there, all the new SDKs, uh, for example right now there is a Ruby SDK proposal out there, if you, don't, if you are in, in, anyone into Ruby. Uh, that uh, and this uh, proposal, like first phase of this Nexus project, is out there. So please check it out, comment. We want a feedback. It's a uh, level of design right now. But the biggest, uh, I think, um, not complain, but uh, if you go to our forum, so go to uh, Slack, you, you clearly see that people get temporal. It takes some initial harm, but after people understand how to write code. They implement super complex applications on top of Temporal without talking to us. They can ask questions about specific edge case and so on, but it's code. You know how to program Java, you know how to program Go. We don't need to teach you that. You can do it better than us. And uh, that's why I think uh, if you look at our forums, a lot of questions are about how to run Temporal, how to operate Temporal, especially at large scale, at la especially with high reliability at the companies. And the way we're planning to, to kind of help you there is and obviously, Temporal as a company is going to monetize this open source. Uh, this is one thing which we don't want to play with licenses. We don't want to go this open core model when we will kind of create this enterprise version, like take some features, I don't know, some or something out of that and uh, not let you to kind of use full version. We don't want to do any of that. We don't want to change licenses. We want to keep MIT license. We want to have open source being very feature rich. But at the same time, we hear it all the time. People just don't want to run any infrastructure themselves. They just want to rely on ours. That's why Temporal Cloud is the uh, way we are planning to help, uh, like with adoption. You can develop and uh, run production with that. The idea of Temporal Cloud is that we're not going to host clusters for you. We are giving you namespace as a service. Practically, the idea is that you don't know what's out there. It's just uh, so fully serverless namespace as a service offering. On the cloud, you just provision namespace using API CLI or UI. And you get this namespace, you can just start using that right away and it's production quality service. And uh, you don't need to think about clusters, you need to think, think about capacity, all of these things are taken care of. And uh, I want to just give you some preview of that. Uh, Mike, uh, I, I want to invite Mike, uh, our 
to, to help there. And uh, he will give you even some demo, and then we'll, we'll talk more about that. Thank you, Max. So I get the opportunity to give you all that first look of Temporal Cloud and uh, the new features that we've been working so hard on to make this adoption of namespace as a service even more streamlined. So one of the exciting things coming up is that uh, creating a namespace is now going to be fully self-serviced. So the design partners that we've been working with so far are going to understand how uh, much of a benefit that is. No more Zendesk tickets. And um, so uh, th this, is a, this is a really big deal. So I'm, I'm going to take you through uh, real quickly a process of creating a namespace in, in the cloud. And uh, just as a quick reminder, a namespace is the uh, fundamental unit of isolation in Temporal. Uh, it's used for uh, a variety of reasons, uh, however you want to, want to um, isolate your services. So it might be based on application, team, organization, environment, or a combination of any of these. So real quickly, I'm going to go out to the interface and show you what it's like to create a namespace. So it's pretty straightforward. I need to provide a name which just needs to be unique uh, for the Temporal Cloud account that I have. And I need to choose one of the seven regions. We're going into other regions uh, and we're also uh, planning to support other cloud providers as well. I need to specify what the retention period is going to be for the namespace. Uh, as a reminder, this is the amount of time that workflow history remains, closed workflow history remains uh, in your storage. And I would need to provide a certificate uh, because uh, all of the connections to the cloud are secured uh, via MTLS, okay, so from your workers or from your client. I can optionally provide one of the certificate filters. Uh, these are uh, useful for that segregation reason. reason uh, it can simplify your certificate uh, strategy at your organization. Uh, so maybe you want to aggregate namespaces according to environment or however you want to approach that. And then finally, I can optionally provide um, search attributes. Uh, whenever you are, have a temporal cloud account, then you have advanced visibility fully backed by Elasticsearch. Okay, so when I create the namespace, it does take a few moments to appear. Um, and so what I wanted to do, one of the questions that we get that comes up is, what does it mean to adopt Temporal Cloud? How do, if I'm an existing Temporal user, how, do I, how easy is it to migrate my code over to embrace the cloud? And uh, so I want to go into that, uh, but real quickly, I just kind of want to uh, review what it's like to even adopt Temporal at all. So. Uh, you're going to have your, in your own uh, environment, you're going to have your own workers that are connecting to Temporal, and uh, you're connecting to Temporal services, whether it's your own self-hosted instance or whether it's in the cloud. Uh, so what does the code experience look like? I'm, a, I'm an engineer, I'm doing some local development, uh, I've got some things working, so I'm just going to do that for you now. Uh, right now I'm going to just fire up a local uh, instance of Temporal uh, using Temporal Lite, and uh, it's pretty straightforward. A lot of you have already experienced this, so I'm just going to start a workflow out of Temporal. You'll see some logging going on. Uh, I, what I'm doing is the ubiquitous money transfer application. Uh, so I've just transferred uh, a million bucks from one account to the other. But it hasn't happened yet. Uh, so I need to start my worker. And down below you'll see that the transfer has taken place, and so on. So many of you are, have already gone through this sample or similar. Uh, so what do I have to do in order to uh, change my code from running locally and run this in the cloud? So uh, this is the uh, a typical uh, client factory for uh, Temporal, the Temporal client. And uh, there's not a whole lot of uh, voodoo going on in here. This is just uh, I have an environment variable where I can specify using TLS to, con uh, to connect uh, to Temporal. Obviously, if I'm running locally, I don't need to worry about that. Uh, but I want to run this in the cloud, so. So let me share, share with you just a few of the variables that I'm going to have to change in order to do that. 
first, instead of using localhost, I'm going to use a address that's given to me from the namespace that's handed to me in the cloud. So I have a namespace that I created earlier, and here's what the address looks like. So I have the namespace identifier, is, is, or the namespace was called payments dev, and then my account name, my account ID, is sdvdw. So the namespace ID then is a concatenation of those two things. And this is just a, a typical gRPC endpoint that I'm going to use as the address that I'm going to pass in. So let me comment this out. And one thing that I've got here in the comments is just an indicator that uh, operating temporal is very much the same uh, in the cloud as it is to your current temporal instance as well. So I can use tcontrol, which is our command line client for uh, operating uh, temporal on the command line. And um, it's just, I'm going to be passing in the same address uh, into the command line there. Uh, so now that I've got these variables set up, this is going to be uh, used by my client. And this time I'm going to be using TLS to connect, so I'll specify that here. And let's go ahead and start the money transfer again. And I don't want you to think I'm lying, so I'm going to stop temporal down below. Okay, so I've just started a workflow out in the cloud. And so before I go and start my worker, what I'll do is pop in to the workflows view that's out in the interface. And you'll see that I have a running workflow. This is what I just executed or just started. Okay, so I'm going to go into the workflow here. Really, I am. Oh, right there, okay. So uh, this is showing me that I don't have a worker running. There's nothing picking off the tasks off the queue, right? Uh, there's nothing new here, uh, except uh, I am going to uh, point out that my access to this namespace uh, was made available because I'm a global admin on this account. Uh, this is another new thing that we're rolling out uh, in the cloud, which is role-based access controls. Uh, so over here on the left, you'll see a little usage tab. Uh, that's only uh, viewable because I I'm a global admin. Uh, you can also designate namespace admin, developer, and so on. And uh, this is super exciting. Uh, if you've been working with the cloud already, uh, you can finally uh, govern access to these namespaces and also the uh, different affordances that are inside of there. So uh, that's great. So now I'm going to go ahead and start up my worker and fail because I did not have my TLS flag set up. Okay, so I just deposited a million dollars from Maxime's account into mine. And so now I can go out to my workflow and see that yeah, the workflow is completed. So one of the questions that comes up a lot whenever uh, people are moving into the cloud is, you know, how do I know what's going on inside of my workloads now? Uh, whenever I was running Temporal uh, in my own environment, then I had access to the metrics. I had access to uh, controlling things, right? All the little do uh, dials and knobs. So, uh, so how do I know? Uh, so there's two big improvements uh, that uh, are new features that we're rolling out that are super, ah, super exciting. Uh, so the first one is uh, the ability to go out and generate an endpoint down in the settings. You can go into the observability panel and pass in a certificate here that uh, you can generate an endpoint that you can use as a uh, data source in your Grafana dashboards. Okay, so what this is exposing to you is a subset of those temporal service uh, metrics. Okay, so it's not all of them, but it's, uh, it's the critical ones that um, a lot of your set have alerts set up on already. And uh, if, there, if you need something else, then, uh, you know, uh, talk to us and and uh, we can work with you to see what we can put in there uh, to help you uh, be able to monitor your own applications. Uh, so you can, uh, here's a, we have a dashboard that we can hand you uh, that has all those uh, metrics already set up. Uh, another feature that we're rolling out, uh, which is 
thrilling for uh, understanding your costs inside of Temporal Cloud and also understanding what am I doing, right? You're, we're writing these workflows and we're using these primitives and uh, we're spread across teams and maybe you want to have an overview of how many queries am I sending, how many signals am I sending. Um, this is really important if you're paying for it, right? And um, so this new usage view, uh, there's a couple of views here to look at. One is I have an aggregated view of the namespaces. Uh, I'm a global admin, like I said earlier. And so I'm able to go in and see a, an accumulation of all of these across the namespaces. And here's a daily view that lets me go in and actually see bursts in traffic. Uh, so you can see I have one in namespace uh, that I was just jamming. I was using Meru to jam a ton of traffic in. And uh, so I've got, I was doing this uh, all day yesterday, you can see. I was just jamming a lot of uh, traffic in there. So I can see uh, what's going on through the day uh, and be able to optimize my workflow. So it's not just a, a cost estimator, but it's also just to understand what's happening inside your, your workloads. And this is also available in the namespace itself. So if you're a namespace admin or anyone that can access the namespace, you can actually go in and see what is the usage on my, on my namespace. And it's split up according to those primitives. That's huge. Um, uh, today it's kind of hard to tell uh, what are the different commands, you know, what, what are the actions, what is an action, you know, what's going on inside of my workflows. Uh, we spend a lot of time with our design partners uh, trying to help them understand their costs. And so this is, this is a huge deal. Uh, so I, this is a real quick snippet on uh, just some, some of the features that we're rolling out. You can expect to see other features like uh, there's batch operations uh, that are going to be available uh, via uh, T-Control uh, when connecting to the cloud. Uh, we have audit logs for security logs and so on coming out. Uh, so th there's a lot of great new features that we have planned. And uh, the intent here is to get it so that you can start working on your, keep working on your features instead of just always dealing with the services, right? And uh, so I think you'll agree this is a big step for us. Thanks, Mike. I think one important thing is that uh, we show you the cloud, and I know that we have uh, quite a long uh, sign-up list, uh, so uh, we can sign up for the cloud, but uh, we didn't implement yet the self-account provisioning. So once you get account, you get this experience, so you can manage everything yourself. Uh, so uh, what we want to do is uh, we will uh, first we are working on implementing self-account provisioning so you will get it probably early next year but uh, we still we want to go through that backlog uh, as fast as we can uh, once we uh, fully release these features uh, later in september or beginning october and so uh, if you are on this wait list please or you're not there please sign up uh, you can find it in temporal.io slash cloud link to that and you will get email from us. Right now you will get email, and if you're interested in signing up, uh, please reply to that email. You can f fill up the online form, and uh, uh, we will provision namespace for you as fast as we can. Um, I think the, a couple of things about uh, uh, cloud in general is uh, it's very scalable. Uh, we uh, can do uh, right now what we call up to 200k actions per second per namespace, and we probably can go higher, but uh, talk to us. And action is, in this case, is uh, not event. It's an actual act activity execution, signal, workflow start. So if you have a workflow with 10 activities, it's probably like 11 actions, I think. Uh, so it's pretty easy to kind of guess how many actions your workflow will consume. Uh, and uh, we can go pretty high rates, and we have cus uh, customers in production. Uh, one thing about cloud, uh, we are showing you preview, but we have uh, Companies, uh, we have over 50 what we call design partners, which are actual paying customers, which are on our platform for like over 18 months now. Uh, because one thing to understand, uh, Temporal as a product uh, was pretty stable. Like data plane is stable. It was production worthy for a long time, just because we started at Uber and was production there for three years before even Temporal was created. So uh, our cloud was robust and like very uh, mature from the beginning from the data plane point of view. But we spend time doing the control plane. We want to make sure that we onboard more people. It's all fully automated. We don't want to do manual operations. So all upgrades and everything, all provisioning, everything is obviously, you can guess, is a bunch of workflows because uh, 
it workflows are the best way to do uh, infrastructure provisioning. Uh, so we are working on these workflows, making sure this uh, experience is as perfect as we can get. And we hide all the complexities of managing clusters because we give you just namespaces. Um, and uh, other thing which is worth mentioning is that right now we're in AWS only. We certainly want to be in all major cloud providers this time. So next year we will start looking into the at least second provider we will see. Talk to us, actually we want to know which one to go to. Uh, so it's, uh, but, uh, and uh, other features we want to do is, for example, we want to be able to do live migration from uh, what we call namespace migration from OSS to cloud without downtime and back. Because we want to make sure that we want to have guarantee that you always, if code runs in the cloud, can run back on OSS without any changes. And we want to actually even support live migration back and forth. And then also between regions, for example, you should be able to take namespace from AWS region one and migrate to, I don't know, Azure region two, then GCP region three, and then back to your OSS if necessary. I wanted that demo. We'll do it maybe next, next, next conference. Um, yeah, I think this is a kind of, uh, end of this talk, but I, I just want to emphasize again, thank you for being here. It's, uh, I think it's exciting for us, but I believe it should be exciting for you as well, because uh, you're kind of early adopters of this technology, and I believe this technology will be uh, something which actually can help you in your career as well, and uh, kind of in what you're doing in your companies. Uh, one thing is uh, just, uh, worth, I, I had a lot of talks yesterday, and uh, it's interesting to see people from like the largest corporations on earth being here. And at the same time, I had talked to a founder of a startup, which is not even founder yet. He's saying, I'm going to do startup, and I'm working on the idea of the startup, so trying to figure out what I'm going to do, but I know I'm going to use Temporal. <laughs> so I think this is uh, exactly what we want. We want every startup just uh, assume that Temporal is the default if they want to implement any kind of business logic. Thank you.